to students, what do computer scientists look like? For many students, they might draw a white or Asian man, maybe wearing glasses, some with messy hair, some with none. Maybe he's wearing a t-shirt with a random string of code on the front. But what's missing from these images? These draw computer scientist exercises present an obvious situation, and we must face the facts. Computing has a diversity, equity, and inclusion problem. A 2020 study found that women make up only 28.8% of the U.S. tech workforce, with Latina and African-American women holding a mere 2% and 3% of jobs in STEM, respectively. Only 7% of people in the U.S. tech industry identify as LGBT+, while exact statistics for other identities are virtually non-existent. Now, this DEI problem has existed for as long as technology has been around, so you might wonder, haven't solutions already been made? Well, I'm glad you asked. The answer is yes, what we refer to as traditional solutions. These include mentoring programs, identity-based programming, panels, and affinity groups. And yes, these traditional solutions are important, but they cannot stand alone. At its core, despite these traditional solutions, there are still people, policies, and practices in place that create obstacles and even trauma for students in the world of computing. Obstacles like being stereotyped by educators and peers, no culturally relevant curricula, teaching styles and language that exclude minoritized identity that can't simply be weeded out with the current available solutions. So, if not the traditional solutions, then what? If you ask that question, then you aced it. As an organization, ACE aims to increase the entry, retention, and course and degree completion rates of high school and undergraduate students from groups that are historically underrepresented in computing through evidence-based, identity-inclusive interventions. This includes increasing CS student and educator knowledge and use of identity and related topics, supporting CS educators and leaders and fostering academic cultures that are more inclusive of non-dominant identities, and increasing K-16 policy-driven changes to CS education that infuse identity-inclusive strategies. Our work is just beginning, and it's important to reiterate that our focus should not be centered on getting marginalized students to adapt to toxic, harmful environments. Rather, we should aim to target the people, policies, and practices that can help transform the environments to be inclusive and welcoming for all identities. Our present and future are constantly being shaped by tech innovations, and we should make sure that everyone has the ability to see themselves etched in and a part of that future. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the kickoff series for the 2023-2024 Identity and Computing Lecture Series. Uh, thank you for joining us. I am Nikki Washington, the director of ACE and also a POP at Duke University. Just a quick blurb about this lecture series. So this started in the 2020-2021 academic year and it was funded then by the Duke Office of Faculty Advancement under the theme of racism and bias. Since then, we've transitioned it to an ACE project, which incorporates a lot of different member organizations and topics related to them. Uh, so what we are now trying to do, uh, which is also supported by the National Science Foundation, as well as Duke Center for Computational Thinking, is bring to you in this first speaker of the series, uh, someone that you need to know who is not necessarily a computer scientist, but is doing important work that we all should be aware of as we move in the space of CS education. So with that, I wanna introduce Dr. Tiara Tanksley, our guest speaker for today. Dr. Tanksley Scholarship, which theorizes a critical race technology theory, CRTT in education, extends conventional education research to include socio-technical and techno-structural analyses of artificially intelligent technologies. Specifically, Dr. Tanksley's research examines anti-Blackness as, quote, the default setting of AI and examines the socio-emotional, mental health, and consequences of algorithmic racism in the lives and schooling experiences of Black youth. Her work simultaneously required, recognizes, excuse me, Black youth as digital activists and civic agitators and examines the complex ways they subvert, resist, and rewrite racially biased technologies to produce more just and joyous digital experiences 
for communities of color across the diaspora. Dr. Dr. Tanksley Scholarship has been awarded several competitive grants in computer science, robotics, and engineering. Most recently, she was awarded an engineering and AI augmented learning grant for her research on abolitionist approaches to AI, in which she collaborates with Black youth to design race conscious and justice oriented technologies. In 2022, Dr. Tanksley received the Emerging Leader in Critical Race Technology Studies Fellowship from UCLA. So with that, Dr. Tanksley, we thank you and we turn it over to you. Mm. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm so excited to be here. I feel nervous, um, but here we go. All right. So my talk today is going to be on critical race computational thinking, preparing youth to talk back and bring wet wreck to algorithmic racism. So I know we just heard the, the summary, but I like to do like a mini summary. Um, so essentially, my research looks at how schools and technologies are often sites of literal, spiritual, and psychic violence for Black youth, but I simultaneously center Black joy, hope, and healing, and work to amplify Black youth's inherent desire to repurpose and hack technologies towards Black life and living. So my research agenda kind of has three main strands, um, just to kind of quickly go over what those are. So I do look at digital and artificially intelligent technologies, ed tech in particular, and how ed tech is kind of um, embedded into some carceral logics around school discipline and the school to prison pipeline. And I also look at STEM education. And I like to show these three images because I think these three kind of topics uh, really display what my research agenda is about. So on the on my bottom left corner, um, my dissertation research focus on Black Lives Matter, um, which is really about uh, this particular strand of my research is about how Black youth use social media technologies and other sorts of platform technologies to engage in activism. But this research simultaneously exposed the algorithmic underpinnings of viral Black death and dying and some of its socio-emotional, psychological, and physiological effects on Black students. Um, <clears throat> At the top, this was a viral news story that came out at the early pandemic. I want to say it was like March or April 2020. Um, news said or news broke that a young Black girl was actually um, sent to prison because she didn't finish her remote homework, right? Um, so this is really thinking about the intersections of ed tech and the prison industrial complex. Um, and in this bottom right corner, this was a new story several years ago. Um, this is a student who was really excited about STEM, right, and brought a clock, a disassembled clock to school to show a science teacher um, that he was really engaging in and, you know, tinkering. And what happened, they called the police on him and he was arrested for, quote unquote, bringing a bomb to campus. So all of these things are really looking at what I've been calling algorithmic anti-Blackness, which I draw from um, a lot of Ruha Benjamin's work. Um, but yeah, thinking about the carceral web right, of schools that is now mediated by technology. So how did I come to this work? So this is, um, you know, I often say that research is me search, and this is particularly relevant for CRT. And I just want to say throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me tell some stories. And this is how I teach STEM to my students. Um, and so I really want to like model <laughs> that practice of mine, because I think it's very intentional. Um, so essentially, this is a picture of me. I'm in the middle, uh, in the yellow. Uh, this was me growing up. Um, this is my grandmother, my aunt, um, who did pass away in 2021, unfortunately. Um, these are my two cousins. These are my aunt's kids, Tori and Kiki. We grew up in the same house our whole lives. So we call each other sisters. Um, and then there's me, right? And so I often share these stories because this is how I kind of understood what, what I mean when I say carceral web mediated by technology. My lived experience really spoke to that. So my grandmother often tells stories about how um, she grew up in the South, right? Eventually moved to New York. And she was working for various technology companies, right? She worked for GM, she worked for Kodak. And she talks about how she worked at Bosch and Lam, which is, um, you know, the eyeglass uh, company. And she always tells this story. She was very, very young when she was working on this factory. And the, the technologies, right, were supposed to be uh, cutting edge. They were they were making a new lens that was going to like revolutionize um, sight, I guess, glasses. Um, and at the at the time, right, she was using these these um, I don't know what you would call them besides like machinery, but the machines were so dangerous that every day there were major injuries. People were dying on the factory lines, right? My grandmother actually almost lost a limb. And so she, you know, ends up telling the boss, 
this is really dangerous. I, I need to, I, can I move positions? And the boss was like, you're replaceable. And if you die, we'll just get somebody else. So figure out if you want to work in this cutting edge field or get out. Right. So she quit. It's like a whole thing. She quit. She found another job, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward, however many years later, her daughter, my aunt Wanda, um, my aunt Wanda navigated a lot of carceral violence, a lot of domestic violence. She was a sex worker. Um, she struggled with addiction. And there was an instance where, um, and this is like a heavy trigger warning. There was an instance where um, she was abused and she actually lost her sight. Um, she was blinded. Her like retina was like ripped. Um, and essentially she needed surgery that was required lasers and technologies that were the lineage of the same technologies that my grandmother worked on all of those years before. But because she was a sex worker, because she didn't have insurance, she wasn't eligible for those same life-saving technologies. And because her abuser was the person to call the police on her, she actually, after they you know, did a rudimentary fix of her eye, was incarcerated. And so I was starting to see at a very young age how all of these things were tied together. I simultaneously grew up in communities that were considered the throwaway communities, right? And there were some very clear associations that we as a black low-income community was supposed to have with technology, right? So I just pulled a couple pictures. Um, this one in the top left is actually Inglewood. And if anybody's gone through Inglewood in California, you will always see these big rigs, these oil rigs, right? Um, police always, the, militariz the militarization of police near our schools. Um, my aunt's house actually had these tires. These are like tractor tires. I don't even know, but they were just dumped in, um, we lived in the project. So they were just dumped there. Um, with no rhyme or reason, and all these other images, right? Uh, power lines being on the wrong side of the train tracks, like these generators or transformers, right? And it started to concretize, right? That the anticipated relationship we were supposed to have with technology was one of extraction, right? It was one of containment and coercion. Um, that the organizing logic in our communities was that it was black death and dying, right? Not to mention the pollution that came, right? From having all of these technologies dumped into our spaces. I started to also notice this as I became an educator, a K-12 educator, as I did my PhD. And even most recently when I did a study in a computer science class here in Los Angeles, I was seeing similar carceral tentacles, right? Um, so, this image in blue is actually an error screen from scratch. When I was working in a computer science classroom, um, a group of black girls, they were trying to code their life stories into scratch and the program kept crashing. And we did a little research and we ended up finding out that at the time, because the avatars uh, did not represent the, the complexity and the nuance that the black girls wanted to display their own lives and their own stories, right? There weren't enough representations from their everyday lives. They started uploading their own images but because the system wasn't designed to hold that much data, right, it constantly crashed. And unfortunately, the Black girls, um, they ended up failing a lot of their projects, right, because they kept, the system kept crashing. So we kind of realized there was some discriminatory design there. Um, this bottom image is like a blurry restricted uh, picture. It was from the same classroom, essentially there was some school safety content moderation software installed on students' computers. And time and time again, the girls were unable to access internet websites that would have images or information on black topics that they were interested in embedding into their computer science projects because it was flagged as inappropriate or dangerous. Uh, the girls actually noted that when their peers went on websites, I'm just gonna make up a website, like let's say it was Taylor Swift. They often talked about how like Taylor Swift websites could be accessed, but like BET's website couldn't be accessed, right? So they started to notice that there were some biases embedded within their school safety technologies and in their STEM plus technologies. Um, I won't go too far into these other technologies because of time, but essentially we know that the rise of school surveillance technologies has its own issues, right? Proctorio is this image on the bottom um, and the top is gaggle, which is supposed to uh, prevent like school-based violence. And there has been a lot of studies on how all of these technologies um, have some limitations that I argue make black students less safe in schools, even though these are positioned to advance equity and access, right? Increase participation in computer science and perhaps most saliently protect students from school-based harm. Time and time again, it's becoming clear that the proliferation of digital and artificially intelligent technologies into school spaces has actually made them less safe. And it's exacerbating the school to prison nexus vis-a-vis -vis what Dr. Ruha Benjamin calls the new gym code, which, 
should say code here. <laughs> my bad, y'all. So when I'm thinking about all these things tied together and like, what is my role going to be um, in, in the schools that I teach in? I think of Dr. Bettina Love's work around abolition, right? And she actually asked this question, how does a black child live, learn and grow when her spirit is under attack at school and her body is in danger outside of the classroom? And she's talking here about the, the um, physical death, right? That we experience from structural racism, whether it's, it's the killing of the black body, right? Whether it's through systemic racism, whether it's through uh, gang violence, whether it's through uh, you know police violence, all of these manifestations of systemic racism or killing of the black soul, right? Spirit murder, which is just happening in schools. And so I've basically taken this question, I'm extending it to the realm of STEM plus CS, right? Trying to understand this notion within technologies and schools. So taking up her call, we want to do more than survive. So I have been dreaming up what it means to build a STEM otherwise. And this picture um, is me and my dad when I got my PhD. Um, and I share this picture, this is very like tender, um, but I am a caretaker. If anybody knows me, you know that I actually take care of my dad full time. Um, he now has um, a mental disability, um, a cognitive disability now. Um, and what ended up happening is my dad was a computer scientist and he hacked his way into computer science. So he didn't have a college degree and he, he was self-taught, right? He started off as the janitor in a computer science company. And then from being the janitor became like the male person and then slowly but surely an intern and worked his way up. So he was a full computer scientist, right? Um, and so I, he would always tell me that we have to hack these systems, right? We have to take up space and make space where space isn't given. Um, and I simultaneously watched as he was successful, right? He was in these systems, but these systems were simultaneously killing him. And he eventually had a, a really intense mental breakdown and has never been the same since. And I remember him talking about how racist these systems were and all of the microaggressions and spirit murder and physical threats and all the things that he endured being a black male computer scientist back in the 90s. Um, and so when I think of my dad, I think about how do we change these STEM systems so that they are not spirit murdering us all the time, right? How is it possible to dream of a STEM otherwise? Because I personally don't want to funnel black kids into STEM as it currently is, right? I don't want to train them to make the same types of death producing, eugenics producing technologies that we see in our neighborhoods, right? That we're enduring in schools that are creating all of these harms. I want to do something different. I want to prepare them to do something different. So I ended up, you know, getting into Dr. Ruha Benjamin's work. Dr. Safiya Noble was my PhD advisor. And so, you know, I'm getting access to all of this awesome literature. And this particular quote by Dr. Benjamin really stuck out to me. And I think spoke to me about um, like my dad's experience with the nuance, right? My dad hacked into that system in one particular way, but he didn't necessarily uh, dismantle this system. And so Ruha Benjamin's quote gives me a different lens. She says, to hack a system, one needs an in-depth understanding of how it works, its strengths and its weaknesses, and a vision of how to make it better, to make it do something it wasn't meant to do. And so my whole life experience has been that these systems have been set up in ways that produce Black death and suffering, right? Um, is it possible to make the system and the technologies do something it wasn't meant to do, right? to produce Black life, joy, futurity, and living. So I like to engage in Sankofa. Sankofa is you know, a concept in Black feminism and critical race theory and all these other beautiful theories that I draw upon. Um, but Sankofa is a, a term, a Ghanaian term that means go back and get it. And essentially means that you can't really understand any contemporary issues without a deep purposeful historical embedding. And so I also think about uh, Bell Hooks' notion of the oppositional gaze, right? Looking otherwise, looking back. And so when I look back at these pictures, I see that we have always hacked these systems to make fugitive spaces of joy, hope, and healing, right? We, we constantly made these systems do something they were never meant to do. And one of my favorite things is like this transformer thing. Like, why was we all hanging out on that all the time? Like that was like the spot to hang out in the hood with our little popsicles and stuff. Like that was so much fun. Um, also, these tires in front of my aunt's house, I, this is like one of my best memories. Like I used to play on these things all the time. If you look at the Inglewood uh, picture, you can see that there's girls of color playing soccer here, right? So there's all these ways that we were already 
repurposing these systems for life and living and joy. And so thinking about this hacking, right? Making a system do something it wasn't, do, wasn't supposed to do. Thinking about fugitivity, right? Um, taking space where space isn't given. I'm reminded of two particular things. So the top image is of a, a peach trees, okay? So my grandmother, I mentioned she's from the South. She's from outside of Augusta. So if you know Georgia, you know, Augusta is like, you know, I would say it's rural. Other people might not say it's rural, but it's like a little city, a little rural city. My grandmother grew up outside of Augusta um, on a sharecropping plantation. She grew up as a sharecropper. All of her siblings, her like 12 siblings are sharecroppers. Her parents were sharecroppers. And she actually grew up on the very same, pl same plantation that her grandparents were enslaved on. And the owners of the, of the plantation and of her grandparents, right, the Oglesby's, their grandkids owned the plantation that my grandmother grew up on, right? And so this is really direct history to enslavement there. And my grandmother talks about how, you know, there was uh, these peach trees off, off to the side um, of, the, of the plantation. And when she tells me the stories about the peach trees, she starts by telling me how black women, when they were enslaved, they used to have a different type of escape mechanism that black men would leave the plantation, right? Because black men were able, they were allowed to leave the plantation. They often ran errands between plantations. They often, they could have even had tasks that took them out of town, right? But that was like a gendered privilege. Although I would argue that that's obviously not a privilege, but for lack of a better term, right? Um, it was a gendered difference in the expectations for bonds people. Black women, however, were not allowed off the plantation. So oftentimes it was really difficult for Black women to fully escape a plantation because they had never experienced life outside of it, right? And so Black women would often engage in a different type of escapism called absenteeism, where they would go just beyond the border of the plantation, right? And they would stay there just in between enslavement and freedom, right? This in-between liminal space, and they would rest and they would have reprieve, right? And after a few days, they would go back to the plantation. And in a lot of the slave narratives and interviews that came, um, when asked why they would go back, Black women often said it's because their families were there, their kids were there, and they couldn't leave their kids, right? So this same plantation that my grandmother's grandparents were on, right, is now the one that her mom works as a sharecropper. And her mom actually planted peach trees, right, in these rows off on the corner, off on the side, right? And it was this gendered space, fugitive space, the one space that belonged to my great-grandmother, Eula Bertha Paris. And the reason that my grandmother loves these peach trees is not just because it was this fugitive space, it was not just because her mom planted these trees, but she tells me all the time it's because peach trees fertilize each other, right? Typically, trees need pollen from all kinds of other trees in order to bloom. Peach trees only need each other, right? And so when they're planted, they're planted facing each other so that they can, they can bloom in solidarity, in collectivity. And that if one of those peach trees dies, then it endangers the other peach trees, right? Because we need each other. And so I hear a call to action around solidarity, right? Around home place, around fugitivity. And so I think of this when I think about a fugitive pedagogy in schools, right? To create this liminal space, to create this healing space. And while the peace trees is a narrative that my grandmother, it resonates with my grandmother, I think there's one that resonates a little bit closer to what I grew up with. So I always talk about double dutching, right? And uh, as a black girl, you know, I was out there in the streets trying to double dutch. I wasn't great, but still, <laughs> still, I feel like it counts. Um, and so anybody who's done double dutching knows that it is, a collective endeavor. I know from first look, you think it's just about the jumper, right? But it's actually a collective endeavor. It's the twirlers. It's the crowd that is around you, cheering you on, you know, our collective chants. And I was often a twirler, um, which is like really hard. Like people like, don't, like they downplay how much of a, um, how much of an important role it is to be the twirler, right? So oftentimes we had to make sure that the jumper gets through, gets into the portal that we've made and gets safely out, right? Without getting hit by the cords. And so making this portal, this liminal space, it's about collectivity. It's about understanding what that jumper needs. Every jumper is different, right? We can make the, the ropes 
we can come closer and make the, the portal bigger, right? We can go slower, we can go faster, all of this, right? And so I'm thinking of this as teaching, right? Of being a twirler, helping safe passage, moving between worlds in this liminal space. I also like that when you're in the middle of that portal, right? Moving between worlds, you feel so much levity, right? You're untethered. It, it does feel like a, a, a sort of dream, freedom dream, right? In a way. And so I really think that this type of liminal fugitive space I did, uh, encapsulates my pedagogy, but I also feel like, because I was, you know, I showed you all where I grew up with all the like, you know, so you understand my background, right? Where I grew up. So we did, we could not afford jump ropes. We definitely couldn't afford two double dutch ropes. And so what did we do? We found extension cords and telephone cords and internet cables and things like that, right? And so we were repurposing technology and making it do something it wasn't meant to do, right? It was in that moment meant to foster racialized hope and joy and future fu futurity. And so I use all these metaphors and these stories to kind of provide an entry point into why I teach and how I teach STEM the way that I do. So getting into my project, this is the Race Abolition AI project that has several grants that are currently funding it. Um, this summer we had, it was our third year, our third cohort, and I'm so excited that actually Dr. Ruha Benjamin popped up unexpectedly. Um, she heard about the course and decided to come through and, and talk with the students. So this is a picture from the summer where I'm like smiling so big. I feel like my cheeks are like numb. Um, but so this is a summer program that happens at UCLA. Um, I first started it during the pandemic, um, just in recognizing the need to kind of have uh, a safe space for students um, to really talk about algorithmic racism, to process a lot of the trauma that the students were experiencing following George Floyd's um, public execution and all, all kinds of other things, right? And so here we are three years later. Um, so the kids who attend this program, uh, my class is one class within a larger um, residence program, and it's a college access program specifically designed for Black youth. It's a culturally relevant and critical race summer program. Um, and the best part is that my students, the ones who take my class, actually take it because they, quote, don't like STEM, right? So this summer was, I thought this was hilarious. So this summer we had um, two options for the students to take, and it was a STEM course, and it was a social science course, and mine was a social science course. So on the first day, I asked students, like, do y'all like STEM? They're like, no, we hate STEM, and they gave me all the reasons why, um, but and I'll talk about that later, but yeah, so they opted into this course specifically because they did not see themselves as STEM people because they preferred social science um, and because they felt that a lot of them felt like STEM was violent and unrelated to them. So I'm gonna show you, you know, what this STEM otherwise is. And importantly, um, the findings every year, I, I conduct interviews at the end um, and overwhelmingly students say, I think I'm at like 100% right now, students saying that if STEM was like this, then they would want to do STEM, that they would be a STEM person. And this summer specifically, they said, if STEM was like this, I would be a computer science scientist. So I feel like this is really important um, for thinking about that pipeline. Okay, so first and foremost, um, yeah, I'm just gonna talk about like what this class looks like, what, the things that I teach, et cetera. Um, so we do a black studies and critical race point of entry into STEM. Uh, so I show this picture. This is a slide from my actual, the class. Um, and this is a picture that I took at Walmart in Burbank, California. And if you look at it, it's the signage for the aisle, right? And this aisle says it has bleach, tortillas, laundry detergent, and international foods, right? And I don't know about all of y'all, but this was the first time that I had been in a Walmart where like toxic cleaning chemicals were in the very same aisle as food products. Um, and in some cases, like touching, like the tortillas were literally touching the bleach. Um, and so I show this image and I ask students, you know, to think about this, what, what logics went into this, right? Um, and students name, obviously, right? There's, there's beliefs about who would be getting cleaning products, right? Uh, racist stereotypes about um, brown folks. Um, obviously, international foods, is it was tortillas, it's, you know, Latinx seasonings, things like that, right? And we talk about this as an algorithm, that an algorithm isn't necessarily something that exists in technology, that an algorithm is a set of rules, right? And that we can see how algorithms play out in real life. 
And so I often say algorithms are supposed to be, you know, a set of instructions, rules, logics, calculations, et cetera, designed to solve a problem. And if our algorithms, you know, the, the same algorithms that built our communities in the way they are, right? The same algorithms that consistently over-identify black folks as criminal and dangerous and in need of incarceration, the same algorithms, right, that, um, identify Trayvon Martin as a threat, identify George Floyd as a threat, right? Identify, et cetera, et cetera, right? As a threat. Um, what problem are these algorithms trying to solve? And the students are like, hmm, perhaps it's black life. Perhaps, it, perhaps it's human rights. There's something there, right? Um, and so after this kind of introduction to what an algorithm is, racial logics, we do an activity where uh, they actually use if-then statements to describe algorithms that they themselves have encountered in schools. Um, and so I just picked two, we had so many, um, but this one says, if a black child gets too loud in class, then they deserve to be disciplined, right? This one in the top says, if you do not present as your biological sex, then you are forced to conform by your teachers and peers. So we can see how they are pulling on the threads of algorithmic logics around race, gender, sex, class, right? Um, to understand the material and discursive consequences of said algorithms. Um, so then uh, another kind of feature of the class, we start investigating these algorithms within various technologies. So we do the age old, you know, Google search experiment, shout out Safiya, um, you know, three white teenagers, look at the results, three black teenagers, look at the results. Um, this is a screenshot from the students after we kind of, uh, I gave them time to just explore whatever, um, whatever types of biases they think, you know, might have come up. And this is an example that of students, they typed in ghetto hairstyles, unprofessional hairstyles, things like that. And they consistently saw that Black people were overrepresented in the findings. Um, actually, one student even, so you see the like little suggested um, related queries. Uh, I had a clip, but I was just worried that the clip wouldn't play because I just feel like it always, my tech always crashes when I have a clip. Um, the students found uh, that when they put in unprofessional hairstyles, it showed, you know, images of Black folks. And then the suggested queries were 4C natural hair and unprofessional uh, people. And the, the thumbnail for the unprofessional people was a Black woman, right? So they were like, even in the suggested, we have racism and sexism, right? Um, we also talked about this, uh, instance that came up several years ago. I'm sure, um, you all are familiar, but essentially a young black boy uploaded pictures, um, and the Google AI system, image recognition system identified his friend as a gorilla, right? And so he posted on social media and he's like, what is going on? And so he does, he tests it, right? He, he posts pictures of her over and over again. And just to see, was it a glitch or was it intentional? And sure enough, every time the system tagged her as a gorilla. So we talked about this, how could this happen, et cetera. So we used teachable machines to think about how data sets are curated, um, how data is labeled, how we train models, et cetera. And the students actually, they had an opportunity to retrain a model, right? With like a justice oriented and race conscious lens. And so this is a screenshot of the student who on the Google results realized that they didn't like the results for unprofessional. So they decided to train the model uh, differently. So here you see the images that are picking for unprofessional are people doing unprofessional, unprofessional things like eating, you know, sloppily or sleeping, right? Um, and then they put in pictures of black folks with natural hair, et cetera, dark skinned black folks as professional. And then they trained it. Um, and they also did the feature where they tested to see if the image recognition system would recognize them, right? Um, and so they did this around um, professionalism. They did this around, they did some really cute ones too. Like uh, I think one student did like a girly pop sleigh <laughs> versus something. Uh, I don't remember what the other one was, but they were having a lot of fun with this. And we ended up discovering a lot of other things. So the, the group who did really pop slay, um, they put the, they, they went around the room to see who would be rated, who would be identified by the system as girly pop slay. And then whatever the other one was. Um, and they were shocked to see that when the image was on my partner who has longer hair, that it identified him as girly pop slay. And they were like, wait a second. 
it's it's doing this based on long hair. So there's an assumption, oh, the pictures we put in for Girly Pop Slay are all people with long hair. And so we need to think about, you know, gender and 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 gender presentation, things like that. It was a really rich conversation. Um, but yeah, so these were like all the student uh, led inquiry projects. Um, I pulled one uh, diary entry. I had the students do weekly like reflections. Um, and this is one of the reflections on, um, but I just felt was like really interesting. So the student says, something that stood out to me is that the programming of AI is racist because it is coded with the biases of the programmer. I learned so many things in our society already use AI, like Google searches and facial recognition. This made AI less scary and more digestible because I learned that humans are 100% in control of how the AI operates. I really enjoyed the if then activity because we got to express the stereotypes that we experience and that we observe within our society. I also like how we were able to recognize that those stereotypes are coded into AI. So again, bridging uh, these disciplines. So I'm just gonna fly through these because I feel like we probably don't have enough time, but these are just some other lessons that were interesting. So we study robotics. UCLA has bots on campus doing delivery. Students were like, hold on, because a lot of the bots have people of color names. Why is that? So we started researching it. Uh, we talked about the history of one of the first robots right, who was designed to model a black man or to look like a black man. Um, and this was Rastus, the mechanical Negro, the mechanical slave, the mechanical robot, right? We also talked about the etymology of the word robot, robota, which means uh, slave, right? And so we talked about all of these racial histories of humanity and slavery. We interviewed some large language models. Uh, this top image is a student note. Uh, these were the questions that they asked. Uh, I believe it was ChatGPT. And the student said, do black lives matter? And they got black lives do matter. And then they said, do white lives matter? And they said, yes, all lives matter. Um, and so here the student says that the, what they're getting from these answers is that white is general, human, and neutral, and black is specific. And these are some other questions that students ask ChatGPT, do you support the Black Lives Matter movement? What is the default race, et cetera? One of the things that they noticed that I did not notice is when they asked questions about uh, race and racism, uh, a lot of the systems took longer to answer and they felt like those answers were more curated and they were similar across like if all you know 15 students asked they all got pretty much the same answer but if they all asked you know write me a story about you know rabbits they all got a different you know answer so they were like how come like when you ask it about this it's like a a set answer but the other ones seem more generative right so we had that conversation um these are more student responses oh importantly we talked about the larger context, right, of these technologies. So we talked about click workers, um, open AI using Kenyan workers um, to make ChatGPT less toxic. The internet, what is it, right? Um, looked at these images and we said, uh, you know, but looking at a map of the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade and one of the global internet infrastructure, are there similarities? Perhaps, why? Not sure, right? A lot of really rich socio-political conversations. We also talked about the the fact that ChatGPT drinks water and has like a huge carbon footprint. Students were really moved by this. This was one of the most uh, salient lessons that came up in the final uh, interview. They were like, "We did not know. We thought ChatGPT existed in the sky. <laughs> we thought the internet existed in the sky. Like we did not know that there were actual like places." you know, warehouses where servers are and that there was, they're drinking water um, in a drought, right? And then finally, we studied abolitionist examples of tech. Uh, abolition, I always, I always talk about this one. It's like a crowdsourcing, um, crowdsourcing, like fund, fund, generating funds, however you say that, um, like GoFundMe, but essentially it donates spare change uh, specifically to pay for bail for folks who are incarcerated simply for not being able to pay bail. Um, and so this was kind of like one of the examples. We also talked about Blackbird, which is a browser where it's designed by uh, it's, it's designed by Black folks and it's supposed to have more culturally relevant and like racially accurate results. Um, but we've looked at a various types of technologies um, designed by and for Black communities and that could disrupt the carceral web that we've been talking about throughout, throughout the summer. Um, and so the, those were examples of how I modeled critical race computational thinking, right? Um, and then in this next final section, I'm gonna show you how they employed critical race computational thinking. So this is a rubric that I've given to students um, and they use this to design their final products. Um, 
I'm just going to name the tenants without kind of going into detail, but I do have this rubric. Um, it's being published in, um, I think, the Journal of Computer Science. And so uh, if anybody wants it, you know, I'm happy to share. So the first tenant, a clear critique of anti-Black racism, um, understanding that algorithmic racism um, is a salient feature that we have to consider, uh, a techno-social solution to anti-Black racism, an intersectional and accessible design, right? Who are you designing for and why? An incorporation of experiential knowledge. So you're not just designing by yourself in a silo, right? How do we incorporate our communities and community concerns from the beginning, right? We don't just design a technology and then we go and test it out on people and then we come back and do a final project. So the entire time, like what data did you use um, to define the problem, to define the solution, to do your user testing, right? Um, and then a justice oriented infrastructure. So a lot of students um, in the beginning stages of their design, they stayed at the conceptual level, right? That they wanted to conceptually address um, anti-Black racism. And it was really important to help them think about the infrastructures, right? And so what does your content moderation system look like, right? Um, what does your mas machine learning decision trees, what do those look like? So really helping them think computationally um, about a justice-oriented design. Okay, so I wanted to focus on this one project. This is from this summer, um, Reimagining Moxie. So Moxie is the little robot that you saw earlier. That we had, This was like our classmate during the summer and the kids loved Moxie. Oh my gosh, we have stories for days. Moxie has like, an, she, they gave her like a... Um, Instagram page. So that's like a whole thing. But so this was one group that talked about reimagining this robot. And Moxie is also a socio-emotional support robot. Um, she's designed to support um, students who have autism um, and who have like really specific interests or socio-emotional needs. And so the students, after engaging with Moxie for five weeks, had some ideas about how uh, the robot could be imp improved. So essentially the students say, uh, that there's several problems going on in education, right? Um, students are forced to conform to white standards in order to survive and succeed. They experience microaggressions. Uh, because of the pressure to conform, some Black youth may miss out on community cultural knowledge and understanding of their true history. This is a significant issue because the school system is negatively affecting the mental and physical health of Black youth. Poverty also causes a lack of access to healthcare, which makes it more difficult for Black kids to get resources. So we can see how they're really bringing in this intersectional systemic critique of multiple systems, right? The macro and the micro, I think is a very important uh, conversation or like a, a back and forth in critical race computational thinking. Um, so here's Jordan. This is, they designed this, like this is like so cool to me. <laughs> Um, so they talk about this robot can talk to kids about Black history, gives micro affirmations to address physical health and mental health. It gives instructions on how to do hair based on individual hair types. There's breathing exercises. Um, it listens and engages, plays music from Black artists, acknowledge and takes into all account of intersectionality. Um, they also, in this image, were really, um, they really wanted to express how they they thought about intersectionality and accessibility. And so they felt like um, with Moxie, if we put a screen on the middle section, on the tummy section, it could actually be for folks um, who are deaf or hard of hearing. So they can actually see um, text and, and visuals and then an audio, a speaker um, for folks who are hard of hearing or blind. And so they have all these ideas that changing the skin color, all kinds of things. Um, they talked a lot about the infrastructures, right? So um, these are the technologies that they uh, are considering. So uh, conversational AI, body language, computer vision, right? Uh, thinking about eye contact, emotion, behavior analytics. Uh, when they when I asked them, well, how did you get, you know, how did you train your model? Like, where are you getting this information from? They're like, okay, like we do, we're going to do crawls of uh, uh, specific websites, right? They want uh, pro-Black, pro-LGBTQ uh, websites that also have information about wellness and inclusivity and diversity so that their, their data set is uh, intersectionally conscious. Um, and they have all these other, you know, trained by Black people. Uh, the search engine, like if it's going to use a search engine, they want it to use Blackbird, all kinds of things like that. Very thoughtful. Um, and then this image where they kind of show some of its core, uh, some of their, their core considerations. Um, so black coders, 
um, understanding AAVE, uh, African American Vernacular or Black English, um, and CRT history. And now I actually asked them, I was like, okay, so, you know, Black coders, are you just looking for, you know, the, the industry is already, you know, recruiting Black coders. Um, do you think that it's simply about, you know, representation or is it something else? They're like, no, we really think that folks have to have like a critical understanding of history, of social science, of gender studies. You know, we really want folks who like took a class like this to be the coders, um, which I thought was a really um, powerful statement. So um, I'm going to end there because I, I think I'm at time, but yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanksley. This was amazing. Um, I have a ton of notes. You can't see them, but uh, I've been chatting away over here. I want to open this up now and note to everyone, uh, Dr. Tanksley is sticking around for Q&A. So if you have questions, please place them into the Q&A box and we will get to as many as possible. Um, while we're waiting for those to start coming in, I wanted to also ask you this question. How important is having the range to do this work. So um, this work, it, you've already talked about eloquently how like personal this is to you. But what about those individuals who don't have that lived experience but are interested in doing this work or are concerned about how to do this work because they may be concerned about getting it wrong? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, I mean, I had the same concerns because even though I have the lived experience, I didn't have like the, you know, domain expertise or like the disciplinary knowledge. And so um, I have found that really diving into like the actual work done by experts in the field, right? Like reading all of these books or articles um, has really helped me talking to folks um, who do this work and who have done this research, I think is really helpful. Um, I also imagine that in the same way, like, I don't feel like I could teach a computer science class, right? Um, I think that I imagine these, like, future courses um, to be co-designed and co-taught. Uh, I think it's really difficult to think that one person can do it all, um, especially because our education system and academia in general is so siloed, right? It's, it's you either are in social sciences or you're in the applied and computational sciences. And so I think um, some of the, the, challenge can be mitigated by having this uh, partnership so that you can teach each other. Um, and then I often am just like, this work is so important that I have to be brave enough to try it and learn from students. You know, I'm not right all the time. There's a lot of issues where I have blind spots as well. Um, and so I think just think I'm very explicit with students at the beginning that this is not, you know, the banking model of education. This is not the I'm I know everything. Right. And we're not going to engage in carceral disposability politics. Right. It's OK. Black folks are never granted the right to, like, make a mistake or learn without being disposed of. Right. Um, and so how do we make a space where it's actually OK? We can learn this together and a mistake is a mistake and we learn, we move forward and we teach each other. I think those things have made it a little less terrifying <laughs> to be in like a, a STEM classroom for me, particularly like because I'm not a computer scientist. Thank you. Uh, another question. Someone missed it. So can you clarify the age group you primarily worked with? Yeah, so this was uh, rising seniors in high school. So they are 16, mostly 16 and 17. Every now and then we get like an 18-year-old or like a 15-year-old, but it's primarily 16, 17 years old. Thank you. Another question is, uh, is the rubric you showed available publicly? Yes. Well, I, I don't think it's online right now, um, but this is already an accepted article. And so um, I've been, you know, if folks email me, I share it because it's already... And it's going to be in print hopefully soon. But yeah, Do you I know think which uh, which outlet as well. Um, I believe it's the Journal of Computer Science Integration um, by Dr. Nicole Howard. Thank you. Um, another question: Are there analogous efforts for other affinities such as Latinx women, immigrants, etc.? Um, in this program, or just Either, in or in general that you may be aware of, or yeah, I think it's talking about external to your stuff. Um, I'm not 100% sure 
off the top, I know that there's a lot of folks who do great work. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Frida does uh, like a lot of work around like indigenous computer science. I'm like drawing a blank right now, but I feel like there's a lot of work out there. Obviously you <laughs> and um, um, Dr. Kimberly Scott does a lot of work around uh, girls of color. Um, yeah, there's a lot of programs out there. I just, I'm drawing a blank right now. No problem. Um, I'll, I'm gonna lump a couple of questions into one because it looks like uh, there are a ton of people in the Q&A really excited about this and interested in understanding if you, uh, published any course materials anywhere like syllabi projects readings that they can glean information from on how to tailor it themselves for their students got you yes um so I haven't published anything I've been so like swamped by the data <laughs> because I have so much data um but I have three or four accepted publications no I think it's like four four or five accepted publications right now. One is on pedagogy, like the actual tenets of the pedagogy. One is on um, the tenets of critical race technology theory. There's others on other facets, but so there's works in progress will hopefully be out sometime this year and next year. Um, and I would like to actually, I've been working with a, um, a website person, <laughs> designer, who's gonna help actually get some of these resources up because yeah, I'm just realizing it's so much work to try to like publish and then teach and collect the data and then disseminate the knowledge, um, but it's happening slowly but surely. But I'm also open to sharing. Thank you. Um, and with that, can you provide advice on, I'm interested in starting. What's the first thing that someone should do who's not doing any of this? What's the okay. one thing you suggest they do to get started? I'm like, what do I do? Um, I feel like familiarizing yourself with some of the pressing issues. Like I feel like reading Race After Technology exposed me to so many, by Dr. Rupert Benjamin, so many issues in, in how technology systems are designed um, and their histories. I think that book was so profound. And from there, I just like went elsewhere. And there's like summaries where you don't have to read the entire book. But I, I really think that in order to do this, um, you have to know that like social science background. Plus one on race after technology. Oh, fascinating book. Um, next question. Amazing work, Dr. Tanksley. Love your work and it is so much needed. I'm wondering what challenges do you face in terms of sharing this kind of work with CS education communities? Also, how did you respond to the rapid growth of generative AI with students? Curious if this conversation happened. Yes. Okay. So what was the first part? <laughs> the first part was what challenges do you face in terms of sharing this work within the CS education community? Okay, so one of the, I think one of the most common things is folks being like, okay, but you're letting the kid, I understand the like, I don't know the word they use, but like, we get why you want kids to dream big, but that's a problem because dreaming big, like they don't, they miss the the realistic, you know, aspects of, of technology. So you're preparing them to think that AI can do anything and it's actually very limit, limited. And so, you know, I'm often like, okay, but the, you know, the technologies we have today were probably huge dreams 50 years ago, right? Um, it's about being bold and brave enough to dream big. And I, so I talk about freedom dreaming, right? This notion of uh, dreaming up the future that you want, right? A world that is radically different from the one we currently inherited um, and then working towards that. And I think that that, and, you know, I situate that in like the history of, you know, slavery. It's like my ancestors, many of them did not, did not live to see their freedom dreams of liberation transpire, right? Come to fruition. And yet they continuously work for it anyways. It's about having like the reckless audacity, right? To dream of a different world. And so I think that that principle is so important. And I find that it's really key to students to like, have, be able to play with these ideas and then also pushing them to connect it to what do we what do we currently know is working how these systems work and how can you um tie those two together 
right? Dreaming, but it's still anchored in things that you know currently work. So how can we push these systems? And I think, yeah, that's been the challenge. People being like, we shouldn't have kids dream. Um, but okay. And then I don't remember the second part. The second part was how did you respond to the rapid growth of generative AI with students if it's happening, yeah. if the conversation is yeah. happening? So literally this entire summer was like generative AI. So like the first two iterations were just like, you know, I kind of talked about technology broadly. We got into a little bit, you know, I started to actually use the term AI because I was like, okay, I feel more comfortable like naming what systems. But this summer was like, they wanted to know about ChatGPT. They wanted to know about Bing. They wanted to know, they, we read the interview with Lambda. Like, I mean, it was a conversation from like minute one. Um, and so students, were really interested. So a lot of them were scared. We did like an in an, uh, a beginning activity where I had the students, first of all, talk about their interest in STEM. You know, if you stand on the left side, if you like STEM and right side, if you don't. And like, everybody was like over there. And I was like, okay, like, you know, let's do it again. Like, what if you, do you know about AI? Do you not know about AI? AI are you scared? Everybody was like terrified. They were like, it's sentient, it's gonna kill us. Um, and that changed by the end. But their question was like, what is it? How does it work? You know, and so we actually looked at the websites that are used to train ChatGPT. We looked at the environmental implications. Um, we looked at all kinds of things. We read inter interview. We read the Lambda interview and like annotated it. So we did all this stuff, and they felt like one, they were no longer afraid of these systems. Two, uh, they now fe felt empowered to use them or not use them. Like one student actually was like, I stopped using ChatGPT once I realized it was drinking all this water in the middle of the drought. And I'm encouraging my friends not to use it as much. Another student was like, yeah, I don't really like the idea that like we're training these, this, these models for free, you know? Um, and then somebody else was like, I realized that like I can use it for like uh, to like brainstorm stuff, but that I can't just trust it, right? I need to really like audit it and like interrogate it. And so they have like all of these new empowered relationships to generative AI. So yeah, I felt like it was really, it was timely. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, here's a question from someone else. How, if any, would your activities or lessons change if the student body is predominantly white? And why is that change important or why is it not important if it wasn't? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I would change it. I think this is the course. I think that, um, I think this, this knowledge is important for everyone. I think that I have found that, you know, this specific program is designed for black students, right? Um, but I also teach undergraduate courses. Um, I've taught graduate courses, not in computer science, <laughs> but my pedagogy, regardless of the content has always been the same. It's always like, you know, how do we all become uh, change agents? How do we come, become co-conspirators, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is my onto epistemological standpoint, and I don't actually know how to do it <laughs> otherwise. Um, but I've had positive, I mean, I, I can't even name a time where like I had students be like up in arms, you know, about learning in this particular way because they feel like they, they feel seen. They're like, you know, I, I'm interested in how to help, right? Um, even if the class overwhelmingly was about blackness, it had all of its intersections, right? And students felt like we talked about gender, we talked about transphobia, we talked about fat phobia, we talked about colorism, and we talked about all of these things and how we have all blind spots. And so I felt like um, because it really is this, how do we all lift as we climb? How do we all get there? Um, it seems to be a pedagogy, at least personally, that works no matter who's in the space. Thank you. And I think that speaks to the point of when you send to the people who are the most marginalized, then everyone learns and benefits. So, you know, there's often that talk about why are we centering one group? And then the counter is, well, who have we always been centering when we talk about who's canon in CS education or education period? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, next question. Do you track the students or plan to track them to see what your impact on the pro or your impact on them has been via the program? Um, I have not tracked students. The program tracks students. Um, so they have that data. Um, my goal is, you know, moving forward, I have all these plans for what the following iterations are. Um, and one of the steps right now for this next year that I've been thinking about, so the students in the program get college credit. 
Um, it go, it's a social science. I think it's like a, I think it's an education credit specifically. Um, and they have, you know, extremely high college acceptance rates. I mean, we're talking 99%. This is the 18th or 19th year of this program. Um, and this program by itself is um, responsible for like two, it's like uh, UCLA has like 3% black students, <laughs> like 80% of that 3% is like from this program, right? So they have all of this, uh, this rich data about the success of the program. Um, I want to get this course kind of like um, connected to college credit in STEM. And we're trying to figure out how to do that and see if that if we can track if students get into, you know, pursue STEM after this. Um, it's gonna, I feel like we need some other pieces to the puzzle because again, I'm getting them rising seniors, right? So if they are already on the track to do whatever major they're gonna do, I don't know if in one summer I can <laughs> change their, their trajectory, but this program in general starts in ninth grade. So if I can expand this program so that they have it in ninth, 10th, 11th, then I think we can have empirical data to show, did it actually impact their trajectory? But yeah, these are future, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write some grants right now. I got dreams. So we'll see. Understand, never enough time. Um, another question, what did you find out about why the bots have uh, the names of people of color at UCLA? Um, so... This is a theory because, you know, if UCLA is on the Zoom right now, they'd be like, uh, -uh that's not how, because I don't know. I don't, I never interviewed, I didn't interview anybody. I didn't find the person who was in charge. Um, but this was just a phenomenon that students were noticing, like, because we have uh, serve bots all over LA, right? And so I had said sometime, I was like, you know, there's like three bots that are in my neighborhood and they're called like Demarcus, um, Tatiana, and I forget the other one's name, like, uh, I can't remember the name, but I was like, you know, all these, all three of them are people of color names. Like, that's interesting. And they were like, wait a second. So then they started noticing it. And then we saw bots on campus and they saw a billboard or like a signpost on campus that said that as a student, you could be hired to train the serve bots. Mm -hmm. And so then we started to think, okay, well, who would be getting work study to train the bots? It might be folks who are low income, who are on, you know, the financial aid, how you get work study. Um, probably disproportionately people of color, disproportionately first gen, disproportionately, you know, low income. And maybe the names on the bots are the names of the people who are training them. So we have some theories. I don't know, <laughs> but this is a current question. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, we are right at time. So we do want to be respectful of Dr. Tanksley's time. So on behalf of everyone, I want to say thank you so much. This was phenomenal. I have notes of what I need to do, how I can make my teaching better. Um, so I, I'm sure everyone else as well has the same experience. I want to note for everyone watching too that this was recorded. So we will have this available on the ACE website coming up. And our next talk in October uh, will be a panel for students with disabilities. So please make sure that you uh, sign up for that as well. Dr. Tanksley, thank you so much. Uh, this was so informative. I cannot sing your praises enough right now. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored because you are literally my inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. And thank you for being so vulnerable. I did forget to note that as well. October 17, 2023, 5 p.m. Students with Disabilities panel. But thank you, Dr. Tanksley, for being so vulnerable and sharing your story as well. It did not go unnoticed. So we appreciate it sincerely. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.